This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Ramika Vincent Leary, and welcome to this edition of In Studio. It's an issue of global proportions that deserves our undivided attention, anti-Semitism. It's plagued our society, and that's why it's so important to educate the masses about its destructive nature. Now, according to the Anti-Defamation League, it is a belief or a behavior hostile toward Jews just because they're Jewish. It may take the form of political efforts to isolate, oppress, or otherwise injure them. It may also include prejudiced or stereotypical views. Tonight, we'll be discussing this timely issue during a special broadcast. Stay with us. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back, everyone. In addition to our discussion on anti-Semitism, we'll have candid conversations with children and relatives of Holocaust survivors. But first, as we begin our journey, this segment will focus on what local and state organizations are doing to help shed light on anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. I'm happy to welcome Lonnie Wilk, Associate Regional Director of the Anti-Defamation League's Florida Region. Now, he's joining us via telephone from Boca Raton, Florida. On set, I have Cindy Gross, president of the Pensacola Jewish Federation. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. All right, and welcome to you, Lonnie. So glad to have you. you. All right. Good evening. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. Lonnie, let me start with you. Anti-Semitism, can you please expand on it for us as viewers? Anti-Semitism, many people associate with the Holocaust, but anti-Semitism did not start with the Holocaust, nor did it end with the, Holo the end of the Holocaust. Anti-Jewish hatred has been a constant, really, throughout Jewish history. And since the uh, end of the Holocaust, traditional forms of anti-Semitism, some religious-based, some ethnic-based, some canards have continued on in our society and, frankly, around the world. So it didn't begin with Hitler's rise to power in 1933. I'm glad that you're dispelling that because some people think that that is the beginning of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism has really been around for uh, the entirety of Jewish history. In fact, um, the term anti-Semitism was coined uh, by a German uh, by the name of Wilhelm Marr in uh, 1879, and he was reflecting a ideology that had been prevalent that for for hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, the Jews of Europe and throughout the world had been isolated, had been uh, discriminated against. And in the year 1879, with this coining of this uh, this term, anti-Semitism, it was put into a category. It was uh, put in, the idea and the sentiments were put into a more formal expression. Awesome. We will get back to you in a moment, Lonnie. Let me shift on over to you, Cindy, the Pensacola Jewish Federation. And when we talk about anti-Semitism in your organization, why is it so important to have organizations like yours in existence? I think it's important to have Jewish organizations like ours because we're proactive. We get involved in these kinds of issues and we do everything we can to educate people about it, to um, do outreach programs here in our local communities and globally, actually. And uh, we do a lot in the big scheme of things to rescue those people who are um, in conflict, areas of conflict in other parts of the world and bring them to a safe haven. So from an educational standpoint, I know that there are many outreach initiatives that you have through the organization. Can you tell us about some of those? 
Well, here locally, um, we don't really, fortunately, have to deal with a lot of anti-Semitism. So the purpose of the Pensacola Jewish Federation here in our area is to make a strong, um, vibrant Jewish community, to bring um, people together in our community and in the community at large, and um, do different activities where we have uh, programs and events where we bring um, these types of issues up occasionally. Uh, one big one is uh, Yom HaShoah. Okay. Um, and what Holoc is that? Holocaust Remembrance Day. Wonderful. And it is celebrated, it is acknowledged um, every year here in Pensacola through the Jewish community. And this past year, we actually uh, did the We'll Never See a Butterfly Again, the Pensacola High School drama group presented that to us, and it was amazing. Amazing. And these kinds of um, events and programs are for not only Jewish people, but for the non-Jewish people as well. Lonnie, let me get back to you. Anti-Semitism in Florida specifically, and of course I know you have global statistics as well, but let us start with Florida. Can you give us some sort of idea about what we're facing here? Sure. Uh, in Florida, unfortunately, we are facing a significant increase in anti-Semitic incidents uh, that mirrors uh, anti-Semitic incidents that are occurring throughout the country. Uh, last year, there were 137 verified incidents of anti-Semitism that were reported to the Anti-Defamation League uh, that occurred throughout the state of Florida. And that was a 50% increase over the previous year's 91 reported incidents. Uh, the largest increase in the category of incidents in Florida was anti-Semitic harassments. Uh, in 2015, there were 61 incidents that were verified by the Anti-Defamation League. That doubled last year to, two th uh, to uh, 119. So how does this compare to global statistics? This is alarming, we know. Correct. And globally, uh, while we don't necessarily have uh, numbers for anti-Semitic incidents uh, in every country or around the world, one area that we did explore in 2013 uh, was a global poll of individuals that harbor anti-Semitic attitudes because we know that there are individuals that harbor attitudes of anti-Semitism, of racism, of bigotry, may not necessarily act on it, but as things become more, cultural, uh, more culturally acceptable, it becomes easier for individuals to then act upon those ideologies. The numbers that we came across when we did this global poll were frankly shocking, uh, and this was 2013. The index score, the number of individuals harboring anti-Semitic attitudes in this planet is 26 percent. Mm. 26 percent Awful. of individuals that uh, we had polled for uh, this initiative indicated in one way or the other uh, attitudes uh, and, uh, anti uh, and harbored anti-Semitic ideologies. Thank you so much for sharing that, Lonnie, and I'll get back to you in a moment. All right, Cindy, back to you. There are a lot of people that would like to get involved with the Pensacola Jewish Federation. Tell us how we can do that. We'd love to have anyone who would like to get involved. We're always um, opening <clears throat> our events and programs to the public. We do a lot of, uh, we have partnered with UWF wow. uh, once a year. We do an academic program with them. Uh, we've also recently partnered with Pensacola State College, and we brought right the here. production of Life in a Jar here, and that was done Good. this spring. Right. Um, and like I said, our monthly programs, everything that we do is open to anyone who would like to come. And uh, we actually hold uh, high discussion groups um, once a month, and our Cafe Israel programs are once a month. So we're doing things all the time. You have a lot of volunteers, don't you? You have little kids that come out. You have people holding Israeli flags. You have special presentations there. So is there a membership fee for anyone that would like to become involved? There is actually a membership fee of uh, okay. $50. Um, and 
you do have to be Jewish to be a member. However, I don't want that to you know exclude anyone who would like to be a donor, you know, support supportive donor. Right. So we can always support the Pensacola Jewish Federation in so Absolutely. many ways. I think that is remarkable. Now, Lonnie, the importance of organizations like the Pensacola Jewish Federation, just talk about that for a moment, if you will. Beyond, beyond just Pensacola, I think the Jewish Federation system, the Jewish community centers, synagogues, they all provide a phenomenal home, an area for the Jewish community to come together, uh, to build a home together. Uh, there is a concept in Judaism called a minion. It's a uh, requirement of people coming together in order to pray. And one of the things that I find important about that is that it's a indication from our culture that no one should be doing this alone. There is no community in isolation. Community only comes when you come together. And being whether you're in Pensacola, in Miami, in Los Angeles or New York, or even in Israel, it is it is very important to have a place to call home. And the Pensacola Jewish Federation is a phenomenal home for the people of uh, Northwest Florida. Absolutely, and there's that common thread. So Cindy, let's talk about special services. Do you offer any counseling services? Maybe teaching Hebrew or anything else along those lines? We're a uh, small community here, and we are a volunteer organization. Okay. We'd love to be a able to uh, offer social services and counseling, but we're not able to. However, we do provide Hebrew to anyone who would like to uh, take Hebrew. It's almost, uh, it's about nine months out of the year. We offer beginner and advanced classes. And like I said, um, we reach out, we do a lot of outreach programs with uh, churches in the area. We'll bring in guest speakers and we'll um, cooperate with other churches or organizations. We go out to the schools and speak. We go oh, to wonderful. civic organizations, women's organizations. Um, we're always out there ready to speak to anyone and um, even have had in the past Israeli uh, festival days. So Cindy, if you were to tell anyone out there that's watching this evening about the importance of educating the masses about anti-Semitism, and of course, Holocaust remembrance. Are there any key words that you just want them to remember? Any thoughts? I would just say that we can't forget. I mean, it's so important now because we're our Holocaust survivors are very, very old now, and there are not so many of them around. So it's important for people like our guests that are coming on after me to be able to speak about their parents and their grandparents and relatives that they have because we need to be reminded all the time of what happened and never let it happen again. Absolutely, and well said. It's such a pleasure to have you on the Thank show, Thank you so Cindy. much, Ramika. It's Ramika. been I an honor it. to be in your presence uh, this evening. Thank you. All right, folks, as we head to break, we want to provide you with more information about the Pensacola Jewish Federation. Perhaps you want to learn Hebrew, as Cindy said, or take part in educational in initiatives. Getting involved really is so easy. Just log on to the website, PensacolaJewishFederation.com. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. What can we do when we're in the Pensacola area? What can we do in Northwest Florida? What can we do in South Alabama? People have the opportunity to go down three levels. I'm Sherry Hemminghouse Weeks and I host a show called In Your Own Backyard. I get to share amazing stories with incredible viewers about a place that I love. And it highlights all kinds of area attractions, historic sites. We cover so many vast and different things. Sponsors want people to know about that too. And so that's why it's important to have the viewer support and also the corporate support because they're only promoting and helping their communities all the way around. It's a privilege and I'm so excited to be able to do it.
If you value local programs that don't just educate, but enlighten and empower viewers to make a difference, then tell us. Pledge your support for WSRE now and be more. Happy 50th, 50th anniversary, anniversary WSRE, WSRE from, from Navarre, Navarre Beach. Beach. Hello everyone, in addition to our focus on anti-Semitism, this segment takes us to a place of personal reflection. I'd like to welcome back Lonnie Wilk from the Anti-Defamation League's Florida region, who's joining us on the phone. Plus, we're happy to introduce Dr. Lori Ripps, a child of Holocaust survivors. Such an honor to have you here, Dr. Ripps. Thank you. Honored Can to be I here. call you Lori? Please. Okay. All right, Lori, you are such a wonderful person. Take us back to the time in which the Holocaust event happened in your family. I know that you're a child of Holocaust survivors. I just want you to speak freely. Tell us about the journeys, separate journeys, your mother and father. Right. So um, both of my parents were born in Poland. Um, my mother came from um, a town called Benjin which had 28,000 Jews before the war. My father came from a much smaller town, a village called Pinchiv. And so my mother was 14 years old when she was taken away from her family in a selection. Uh, and the Nazis were selecting um, workers uh, to go to uh, forced labor camps. So she and her sister were taken away on a truck and um, taken away from her parents at the selection and uh, sent to a work camp called Petersvaldau where they survived together. And um, my father, she, my mother was the youngest. She was of, the youngest of how she many? She was the baby of six. Six, okay. She was okay. the youngest of six. Um, her two older brothers had already emigrated to Canada and two middle brothers um, also were, perished during the war. So my mother and her sister were the only two survivors from her family that were in Europe. So your mother's parents, what happened with them? Um, well, we believe that um, within a couple of weeks from that selection, they were um, li the that whole town okay. was liquidated. Liquidated. So they were taken to Au Auschwitz, and um, perished were murdered at Auschwitz. We're going to get to your father in just a moment, but Lonnie, let me ask you this: the ghettos. Can you expand on that? Because a lot of people may not understand how it all came to be. Absolutely. The Nazis, uh, as they invaded countries around uh, Germany, they had decided to implement a system of ghettoization uh, in which the Jewish community was put into a small area, a very concentrated area, and in most cases there was a wall, fencing, or some kind of barrier that was placed so that any travel, any uh, uh, any communication, anything was blocked. Uh, so there was really no opportunity for uh, Jews to be able to communicate to get much word out to the outside world of what was going on. Uh, and this took place in many, many Eastern European countries. So let's talk about the walling, as you mentioned, getting things in, they probably had to rely on what was there. Is that correct? In Inside many the cases, ghettos? they had to rely on what was there. There were a number of cases in ghettos, notably in the Warsaw ghetto, where children would be the ones who were small enough to be able to sneak through the sewers, to be able to sneak through 
uh, any kind of hole that they could find to get any kind of bread, any kind of food, and bring it back in. And in many cases, they, these children, young kids, uh, they paid with their lives. Let's talk about the Star of David for just a moment. Can you elaborate on that and its purpose? It was a sign uh, that this was this was the Star of David. This was a symbol of Judaism, a symbol of identity, of hope, of what you feel best and proudest of. And the Nazis had taken that and turned it around so that in many cases it was not used in every location, but in many locations where it was used, especially in occupied Poland, it was used as a sign of shame. It was used as a sign of identification for being a target, for being a victim. And for many Jews, it was a very difficult thing to be able er, to have to wear a sign that you right. felt you were was part of your identity, was part of your soul, to wear it as a sign that now would indicate that you were a target, that you were uh, a victim. It was a very difficult uh, transition, yes. and it still resonates for many in the Jewish community, the sign of someone wearing a Star of David uh, as an armband. All right. We'll get back to you in just a moment, Lonnie. So, Lori, let's talk about your dad. Okay. All right. So my father was the oldest of six children. My mother was the baby. My father was the oldest of six children. And he came from a very religious family. And he was 17 years old um, when he uh, heard that the Germans were approaching his village. And he knew from, you know, his friends and, uh, you know, it's, times were different then. They, we didn't have the, the news like we do now no, and media. And so word, word traveled by word of mouth. And he heard that the Nazis were approaching his village, and so he had an opportunity to leave and flee into the woods. And he approached his family and asked his parents to come with him and bring the children, bring the whole family into the woods. And um, unfortunately, uh, his mother felt like she couldn't bring okay. all those children, right. and how was she going to care for them? And so he left without them and um, never saw them again. And they the next day, I believe, um, the Nazis came and uh, they were transported to Auschwitz and were murdered at Auschwitz. Oh, so sorry to hear that. Yeah. Now your dad, was your dad eventually captured and transported to a camp? Yes, um, he spent some time in the forest. Uh, he spent some time in uh, a couple of different um, labor camps, but ultimately he went to Buchenwald. Um, which is um, fairly well known, and um, he spent the last year or so at Buchenwald in forced labor and uh, until it was liberated. One thing that you provided for us, which is, is chilling, the rosters at the camps and your father's number, his, right. his number, which they were so organized, weren't they? they Detail were very oriented. Chilling. It very is chilling. quite chilling. And who actually found this document? You told me a little so, bit, but I so want my to daughter, my old, our, our oldest daughter um, is a history major and did an internship at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. And uh, while she was an intern, she did some research, and she was able to pull up 65 documents uh, oh. pertaining to my father and a lesser number pertaining to my mother. So as you can see, um, this is a roster that of just one day, in one, the, day. one day in the life of my father at the concentration camp. His prisoner number is 116177. Right. And you can see that the Nazis put a plus or minus. It was a roll call, basically. And um, it just, um, as you mentioned, quite chilling. It is. Let's go back to your mom for just a moment. Where was she held? She was in a camp called Petersfeldau in Germany. It was a forced labor camp. Um, and she was there for two and a half years with her sister. Um, they managed to survive to the end through starvation and disease. And, um, and they, I believe, probably part of why they managed to survive was because they had each other. Let's talk about the day her camp was liberated. I know that you have a special artifact that you brought with you today. On yeah. the show, can you can you get that so, out for us in just a minute? We're going to take a moment just so our viewers can 
see what she's going to be presenting. Lori, tell us what it is first of all. So um, on the day that my mother was liberated, Hold the, it up if the you Russians will, the Russians came um, to liberate the camp, and my mother they they knew that the you know the, it was coming to an end. Okay. And so um, she this is a um, piece of bread. It was her ration for the day, part of her ration for the day, and she kept it. Um, she wrote on here, bread from Molly's concentration camp. Uh, she was a teenager, and she said she kept it as a souvenir. And um, she just always kept it, and it you know, became kind of petrified. And um, it's just been in our family ever since. Well, and um, oh, it's just and a I tangible, know it means so you know, much. It, it's tangible. Uh, it's a tangible reminder of what she went through. And um, Remarkable that you, that you have it. Now, when her camp was liberated, did she ever go back to that area? Was there a monument set up? There what was. Happened? Um, in 2009, my husband and our three daughters took my mother back to Poland. Okay. Um, my father, unfortunately, was too ill to go. So we went back to Poland and we visited Auschwitz. Um, and we also went to her hometown. And she was able to recognize a lot of landmarks. And she had her family had lived across the street from the synagogue, what was called the Great Synagogue. It was right. a very, you know, big Jewish population at the time. And um, that synagogue had been reduced to rubble um, very early in the war, on September eighth, um, and uh, in 1939. And we were able to go to that site. Lonnie, back to you. When a lot of these camps were liberated, we know that the Nazis were trying to cover their tracks and hide things, but historically we have the proof, don't we? Can you just, as an overview, tell us, I guess, about the liberation of a lot of these camps and just went, what went through the minds of a lot of the people that were in that situation? Many of the concentration camps that were liberated uh, by Allied forces, uh, there were many cases where soldiers reported back they had approached, they had arrived, they had seen something, they're, they're there, but they don't know what to make of what they're seeing. Uh, in fact, uh, General Dwight Eisenhower, uh, who obviously became President Eisenhower, he had made sure that camera crews and uh, delegates from Congress came to a number of the concentration camps as they were liberated to be able to document because of the fact that it was such a overwhelming image, mm -hmm. an overwhelming experience walking through and seeing what many people refer to as, uh, many soldiers refer to as walking skeletons. They wanted to be able to make sure because they said that without evidence, uh, people may doubt that this even happened, but the, and the severity of it. Uh, one other point that I wanted to touch on was the way that you had mentioned earlier, the way that the uh, Nazis were extremely systematic. Right. The move that occurred from ghettoization to really a plan to exterminate the Jews of Europe was uh, done at a location in uh, just outside of Berlin called okay. the Vance. Uh, it was a mansion on the Vance, the, the Von Lake in, uh, in near Berlin. Over about an hour and a half period, the heads of many uh, Nazi and German government uh, branches, they went through and decided how and uh, when and they were going to exterminate the Jews of Europe. There is there were 11 million Jews that were targeted uh, for extermination. That is six million, as we know, uh, six million plus or so were murdered. But one of the interesting components is that you have five million listed in the former Soviet Union, but in Albania, you have the on the list that we have coming from the uh, minutes taken by Adolf Eichmann, by the way, uh, of this meeting at the uh, at Vance, 200 individuals, 200 Jews in Albania. So it was not only important to talk about 5 million Jews in the areas of uh, the Soviet Union, 
but even getting to 200 Jews, 200 individuals, that was still important enough to incorporate. All right. We appreciate that information, Lonnie. Of course, we know that we will be hearing from you again. Dr. Rips, thank you so much for being on in studio and sharing these stories. We appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. We love you. <laughs> okay, folks, as we head to break, we want you to know the Anti-Defamation League's Florida Region is here for you. To find out more information, including ways you can impact lives for the better, just log on to the website florida.adl.org. Hi, I'm Dee Dee Sharp. For over 25 years, I've worked as a news anchor, reporter, and host of AWARE. My career all started in the Television Center at Mobile's LaFleur High School. I served as on-air host and produced short breaks that aired on my local public broadcasting station. Well, that experience as a 16-year-old opened the door for my career. How ironic to grow up with Sesame Street, Reading Rainbow, and Mr. Rogers, and then become your host of AWARE, WSRE's longest running program. PBS and WSRE hold a special place in my heart. I'm Dee Dee Sharp, and I am PBS. If you value local programs that enlighten and empower viewers to make a difference, then tell us. Pledge your support for WSRE and be more. We're back and shifting gears. It's a pleasure to have Lonnie Wilk for another segment, and I'm happy to introduce Steve Nissum, a child of Holocaust survivors. If you think he looks familiar, your eyes aren't fooling you folks. He is a treasured sports anchor and reporter at WEAR-TV Channel 3, an ABC affiliate, which covers portions of Florida and Alabama. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. For, I don't know about treasured, but thank you. Oh, I'm glad people to be love you. People love you. That's what I've heard. Uh, let me just start off with this, Steve. Do you have a monumental sports story that just resonates in your mind, maybe one particular thing that you've covered? Wow. Well, I mean, there have been, been so many. I've been so fortunate to cover so many great events. All the athletes that come from this area is yes. just phenomenal. If I had to pick one, maybe uh, going to the Rose Bowl a few years ago to cover Florida State, winning the national championship, college football. I went to Florida State. So that plus iconic Rose Bowl, unbelievable setting, that was a pretty special moment for me. And it's a special moment for me having you on the oh, set. Thank you. Good to be here. <laughs> All right. Now, I know that you have a lot to talk about because you are a child of Holocaust survivors. Let's start off talking about your dad. Yeah, my, da sure. my dad was uh, born in Salonika, Greece. Uh, that was a very big, uh, that's the uh, second largest city in Greece, a very big Jewish population at that time, about 56,000. Okay. Uh, his, his dad ran a very successful restaurant, one of the biggest in Salonika, he told me. And uh, 1940, he was 13 years old when the Germans came into, okay. 1941 now, when they came into Greece. And he was very headstrong kid. Um, he listened to the radio a lot. He a listened lot. to the news. So he yes. knew that the uh, Germans hated Jewish people. They treated them badly. They put them to work. And he was determined, they're not going to do that to me. So he said, I'm, I'm getting out of here before they get here. Of course, he knew his parents would never let him go. So he decided on his own, I'm going to take off. He was a part of a very large family. Okay. He had uh, four brothers, a sister as well. And um, he said, I'm, I'm going to take off. So he went to one of his, two of his brothers were fighting in the Greek army. Uh, but one of them, he went to him, he said, let's go, let's go to Turkey. And um, his brother said, are you crazy? We're just going to go to Turkey, to another country. And then he found a, a buddy of his, a uh, classmate, and said, well, let, let's go, you know, let, let's leave. And his friend said, okay, let's do it. So first they, they were going to go to the train station. Then they decided to go to the, the dock. And they were trying to get on a ship. His friend lost his nerve. But my dad, he was determined to get out of there. Headstrong. Headstrong, very headstrong. And uh, he, he tried to talk to some people to get him on the ship. Ultimately, he jumped on a rope that was attached to the ship, climbed on the ship, and got on it. And he ended up sailing to Athens. And he had some people help him along the way. But he traveled. He was there for several weeks. And then the Germans were going to come there. 
And then he got out of Athens, got on a ship going to Crete, made up a story they had relatives in Crete. Okay. Was there for a while and um, was there for about a month. And then he escaped from there right before the Germans were going to come to Crete. He, um, they were, there was a convoy of ships that were going to be going to Egypt and he was going to try to get on those ships. But uh, they were, he had gone out of town, a few miles out of town today. They didn't think the ships were going to leave. All right. And then they find out the ships were leaving, and they literally, somebody came in there and said, aren't you the guys who want to get on those ships? They're leaving, like, right now. They, like, they were miles away. They started running. They hijacked a, or they jumped in front of a truck to jump on it to get to the dock. Got there. The ships were already off the dock, but they had a rowboat. They were able to get they on it. They were determined. They determined. They got on it. A half hour later, they left. And then the Germans, of course, shortly after that, took over Crete. So he ended up going to Egypt, and then all through Africa, to, to Kenya, um, Belgian Congo, South Africa, always staying ahead, a, a ahead step ahead of the, of the Germans. Right. And eventually uh, he got back at the end of the war. He, he joined the Greek army when he was too young, when he was 16, 17, so he could find his way back. And then when he, when he got back, he found out that one of his oldest brother survived. He was fighting in the resistance, but his whole family was killed at Auschwitz. His mother, father, three brothers, sister, and almost all of his aunts, uncles, extended family, had one cousin that made it back from Auschwitz, but all the rest of them died. Hold that thought for just a moment because we have more of that story for you to tell. But Lonnie, I want to talk to you for just a moment because your grandparents had an experience through the Holocaust. Why don't you share now with our viewers your personal story? So my, uh, actually my great-grandparents they uh, and most of my family on my uh, father's uh, mother's side, they came from the town of Auschwitz in, in Poland, in, known in German as Auschwitz. And they uh, mostly made it to the United States in the aftermath of World War I, with the exception of a couple of family members, uh, it, most notably uh, two sisters who stayed behind, and as uh, some of the other guests mentioned, when they heard and when they got word that Nazis were invading, they decided to flee. Uh, both sisters uh, had families. They fled on foot heading towards the Soviet Union. And one of the sisters, uh, she and her family said, we can't do this is we're wa literally walking for hundreds and okay. hundreds of miles uh with no destination there was no one necessarily opening the door to take in jewish refugees so one sister and her family uh they headed back to the town of Auschwitz of Auschwitz and this is before the extermination camp uh camps were set up there in the labor camps the unfortunately the in most of the town uh the people of the town which had a jewish heritage going back hundreds of years uh were mostly taken to a nearby town uh called Soznovich and they were murdered uh they were shot and mowed down and murdered there uh and we are just left with imagining what could have been the family that could have been generations later right the cousins the relatives that we don't have so has this in any way impacted your decision to do what you're doing right now with the Anti-Defamation League, your role? Absolutely. Uh, the Anti-Defamation League was founded over 100 years ago to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment for everyone. That intertwined mission statement really spoke to me when I was looking at coming on board with the Anti-Defamation League. The fact that I can work not only to make sure that the Jewish people are safe and secure, but make sure that all people, regardless of who they are, are stood up for, that exactly. no one feels that they are isolated, that they are alone. When individuals, when groups are targeted, it is, I think, most important to stand up and speak out. Right especially when you are not the victim, because of the fact that my family has a history in a town which has one of the most infamous names in the world. It's a, it's a badge, it's a, it's a scar that I wear, that I have. And being able to speak up and make sure that 
stopping hate and bigotry yes. from its lowest levels before it progresses to anything like a genocide we is will. so is so important to me. I love work coming into work every day, and I love uh, staying late. <laughs> All right, not bad. I love bad. doing what I do. We'll get back to you in just a moment. Steve, back to you. Let's talk about your mom, okay, and how your parents eventually met. Well, my mom also Jewish, but her okay. family came from the uh, Russia, Ukraine area. But the, her, my great grandparents, her grandparents immigrated in, in the 1900s to New York. My dad, after the war, there wasn't much life for him in Salonika anymore. Uh, so eventually, he immigrated to to America and to um, to New York, and they they met in New York. So, yeah. how have their experiences actually shaped your life? It's an individual. Well, I mean, when I was younger, I didn't think about it as much, you know. But obviously, if my dad didn't do what he did, if he w did not <laughs> survive, wouldn't I wouldn't be here. Right. And now I have two children, and they wouldn't be here. You know, my dad had the burden of all this. I mean, he was not a, a great guy, really, because all the all the things that allowed him to escape were accentuated, being very selfish, being... Uh, uh, dismissive of uh, authority, uh, willing to lie, do we had to do it. Those were accentuated in him. He also had a lot of bitterness and anger, you know, but I don't have that. You know, I'm alive because of him, and I don't have Absolutely. that. My children don't have that. Um, so we're able to, you know, and, I, and now I can really appreciate that, you know, that the chance that I have because of what he did to escape, you know, but it, it's um, incredible. You mentioned some of the things that he did with being in the Greek army and going to Cairo and yes. then going to Africa. Yeah, I mean, it was incredible. He got, when they got to Cairo, there was a large Jewish population there, so they helped him out. You know, he was 13 years old, but they, they saw this amazing story. This kid came on his own. Uh, they gave him money and food, and they told him, look, you need to, to contact your parents. Have you contacted your parents? And they had him do a, send a telegram. At that okay. time, telegram still got through, and his, so his dad was apparently at the restaurant giving out drinks and, and food when he found out his son was still alive somewhere. You know, so but yeah, he was there, and uh, he he was an, also an amazing story. How he, when he left Cairo, when they thought the Germans were coming there, and he just kind of hooked on with military people and kind of did like just a little office work for them to get by, and he, other stuff. I'm sure he did other stuff he didn't talk about right. to get by. He went to South Africa, and um, it, it was just phenomenal the things that he that he had to do to to, to, to be you know um, to, to to get through it. So let's talk about your communication skills and maybe the things that you do when you're not at WEAR. Do you ever speak about their experiences, maybe yeah, with groups? Just recently, in the last few years, I've started doing it at middle schools in the area because it's perfect. I've been talking to eighth graders at Ransom Middle School. Mm -hmm. I also did it at Brown Barge uh, one year as well. Uh, they did some Holocaust uh, learning in school, and I came in and did a, a talk uh, to kind of give them a real life example of it because my dad was 13 same age as them when he you know had his family murdered when he had to go on the run so it really um, brought it home to them it was really when, when they first asked me to do it I was a little hesitant just because right. I'm more of a private type person but once I thought about it for a second I realized the value in it and it's been such a joy to be able to get the message out there to young people in this area especially in an area where there's not that many Jewish people so they really don't know that much about it they don't understand the impact of it and some of the responses letters they've sent me letters afterward the impact it had on them has been unbelievably rewarding. All right. It has been an honor to have you. I'm a fan. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a fan to you. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you so much, Steve. Appreciate you. My Keep doing what you're doing. All right. Pleasure. All right, folks. Anti-Semitism is a serious issue that has plagued our society at alarming rates. As a reminder, you can plug into more information from the Anti-Defamation League's Florida region by logging on to the website florida.adl.org. WSRE is celebrating 50 years and remembering the show that gave the station its largest audience. Not Julia Child, not just a French chef. For 17 years, Earl Peru mesmerized viewers with classic recipes celebrated on both sides of the Atlantic. The New Orleans native crisscrossed Europe and Japan to study under some of the world's best, then shared his passion with generations of aspiring chefs. That's because gourmet cooking was their classroom and it was yours. Gourmet cooking tempted viewers with irresistible recipes, many rich in local history. Earl Peru's Gourmet Cooking, the first WSRE production to air nationally from the station celebrating 50 years. Happy 50th! 
We're glad to welcome back Lonnie Wilk, who has been with us via telephone the entire time. Now, as our journey continues, we'll also hear from Ariel Kleinerman, the grandchild of Holocaust survivors. So glad to have you with us, Ariel. Pleasure to be with you. Now, I understand that you are currently a Navy pilot. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Um, I'm currently a, an instructor at NAS okay. Pensacola. I teach uh, NFOs in the T-6 Texan on their way to becoming a uh, eventually fighter pilots are, and uh, also P3 and uh, back, uh, helping out in the Navy in general. In the Navy. Yeah. Well, I'm a Navy brat myself. We all appreciate what you do. So let's talk about your grandparents. Can you give us a little backdrop to their story? Um, so my grandparents come from uh, Bukovina area, Basarabia in Romania. Uh, so it was an area that Romania acquired after World War One. Um, and then in the treaty that the Nazis had with Hitler, uh, that, sorry, Hitler had with right. uh, Russia, it was given back to the Russians. Um, so my, my family st stems from that area initially. And my grandfather, um, he actually was quite lucky uh, in an odd way. He had to travel to Basarabia from Romania to visit his father, who was uh, dying from illness at the time. Uh, this is right before the... Uh, 1940 and 1941 when okay. the uh, Romanians joined the the Russians in the in the campaign against uh, sorry joined the Germans in the campaign against Russia um, and then coming back to Romania he illegally was crossing the border got caught uh, was accused of being a communist spy and put in a political prison for the duration right. of the war so he he was quite lucky however his brothers uh, were not uh, not as fortunate so he had there were several siblings as you're saying right correct yeah um, Hersh, who uh, played a great role in our family and uh, later on down the road, him and his daughter, Reza, uh, ended up in Transnistria, which was an area where the Romanians uh, pushed a lot of the Jewish population uh, through death marches, forced labor camps there, uh, a, a terrible region. In fact, ultimately, I think about a third of the population of Romanian Jews was killed in uh, in Romania, but largely in Transnistria. And I understand that your grandmother passed away when you were quite young, right? I would, unfortunately, I was about uh, seven or eight at the time, so I never had a chance to really um, have the her tell me her story. Um, we were a little too young to comprehend at the time. So who actually conveyed their stories to you? Um, throughout the family gatherings. Family gatherings. Um, which, unfortunately, we've kind of a diaspora from as a result of the Holocaust and the communist uh, takeover afterwards we spread out so we had family in Venezuela family in, in Miami and then uh, California and New Jersey but when we had the opportunity to get together uh, it was a frequent kind of discussion of the family history and uh, the horrors that that certain members had to go through so true all right, Lonnie, let's get back to you. Let's talk about your involvement in the March of the Living, if you can explain to our viewers what that is and your role. So I uh, was a participant in the March of the Living. The, it was actually the first Florida College March of the Living back in 1997. Uh, and in subsequent years, I became a madrich, a uh, guide uh, for the March of the Living. It is a program that takes... Uh, young Jewish uh, teens, um, high school age teens, to Poland uh, to see the camps, to see the ghettos, to see, to see these sites, and then 
the participants go to Israel for about a week as well. And it was when I went as a participant, uh, okay. when I was in Poland and being able to see the camps, being able to see the remains of synagogues that were no longer in use, it struck a chord with me. Uh, this was no, not something, this was not that it was a statistic. This is not something that is written on a page. This, These incidents, these matters that we're talking about, that we're hearing from uh, Dr. Rips, from Ariel, it, it, from, from Steve, these yes. are people. The, this is, Absolutely. many people will use the uh, number six million, six million it's really, you want to talk about 5,999,997 and Grandpa Benjamin and Aunt Rivka right. and Cousin Samuel. These were people who should have a progeny and the the lack, the, the void of them is something that weighs Heavily. not only on the Jewish people as a whole but on in, uh, on individuals. All right, Lana, you shared with us some pictures from Auschwitz. We saw some pictures from the ovens, and you provided some pictures from the March of the Living. And I know personally how this has impacted you individually. And so as someone who has led people to Auschwitz with the March of the Living, I know it's emotional for you, but taking this a step further, how has this impacted you even more so working right now at the ADL? I think, and it is, it, it is extremely emotional for me. Um, I, I think one thing that really hit me uh, as I was listening uh, to one of the commercials earlier for WSRE was the quote, enlighten and empower to make a difference. That is exactly why I do what I do. Uh, being able, not, it's not just education for the sake of education. Being able to, and having gone to the sites where 1.5 million yes. children were murdered, being able to transmit that to people who have not been there, but being able to not only enlighten people as to this, but then empower them to have a tangible impact in the community uh, so that when there is a anti-Semitic joke, a racist right. joke, a homophobic joke, a remark, it's important to stand up. I find it important to stand up and say, wait a second. This isn't okay. Right. Because once a remark, a joke is accepted, you can accept laws, you can accept uh, regulations that will be anti-Semitic, that will be racist, that will be homophobic. And it is uh, important at each stage. I, I find it so powerful when individuals that are not victims of an incident, of a hate crime, when individuals who are not directly impacted stand up for others and say, "This is not this is not all right. This is not the way that our society should, should operate." During the Holocaust, uh, or excuse me, during World War II and the Nazis uh, hold on power, there were many many others that were also uh, victimized and targeted for extermination. Um, we'll get the to that. Gypsy Mm -hmm. We will get to that in just a moment because I have a specific question for you regarding mm -hmm. that. But I'm going to head back to Ariel right now and ask you about your grandparents and their marriage when they finally met. Um, so they met shortly after the war and got married. Um, my grandmother had actually had another marriage proposal during during the war. Um, fortunately, uh, at the last minute, the guy had a ticket on the Struma, which was a ship carrying refugees, hopefully to Israel, uh, which unfortunately got torpedoed by the Soviets. Uh, the British uh, wouldn't let it through. The Turks wouldn't let it through uh, the Bosphorus because the British weren't allowing transit passages for the, the passengers. 
Uh, however, uh, the guy at the time had had these tickets proposed to my grandmother, who was a beautiful, very beautiful woman and uh, highly desired. Fortunately, for whatever stroke yeah, of luck, reason. she decided not to to go with him. Stayed, um, managed to hide uh, during the pogroms in Yash, and uh, kind of went hid throughout Romania during the course of the war. Um, and then shortly thereafter, was introduced to my grandfather, and uh, they got married. And the rest <laughs> is history. If you could tell our viewers, especially the younger ones, anything just to make them zero in and focus even more so on the importance of educating the masses about anti-Semitism and remembering the Holocaust, what would you say? Uh, it's, it's a tough question. It um, is tough. It, it, it's, you know, the banality of evil, as, as Hannah Arendt, I uh, believe, called it. Um, you know, it wasn't just not, we like to put the label Nazis, but Romanians were involved. And these are regular Romanians, regular right. Lithuanians, Ukrainians, Poles. You know, a lot of them were taken from their towns and bred on hate, a lot of alcohol Absolutely. involved, but they were going around committing these massacres. And it's just, it's surprisingly easy for people to, through propaganda and bad oh, press, me. just turn one set of the population against the other. And instead of uniting us, we try to focus on small differences and create hate, and, and which ultimately can lead to the pictures what and the gruesome right here. Story All right. Lonnie, I have time for one quick question, one last question for you. So there were others impacted. Let's talk about gypsies, blacks, and those who may have been mentally or physically challenged. So the gypsy population of Eastern Europe, of Germany, the Roma and Sinti, uh, the LGBT population of Europe were targeted very much en masse. One thing that was very telling and gave some instruction for the Nazis in how they would carry out at, uh, mass murders in, uh, in, against the Jews throughout Europe, the mentally and physically challenged uh, were targeted, were, were among the first that were targeted in Germany itself in the early and mid 1930s, and the terminology that was used was life unworthy of life. All right, well, Lonnie, they, hmm? we are running a little short on time, but I do want to tell you how much we have appreciated having you on the show. You are such a blessing to so many. Continue doing all the positive things you're doing with the ADL, all right? Thank you so much. All right, and folks, again, I want to thank all of our guests for joining us this evening. We also want to express our sincere thanks to our guests who provided images for the broadcast, including the following organizations, University of West Florida Archives, the Anti-Defamation League's Florida Region, and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. I'm Ramika Vincent Leary. Have a good evening. And remember to keep it locked in right here on WSRE PBS for the Gulf Coast.